So welcome everybody. Uh, we haven't done a webinar for a while. Um, I feel a little bit out, out of practice, to be honest. <laughs> um, but it's really nice to see so many of you here. Uh, the focus of our webinar tonight is the West Bank and the deteriorating situation there. Um, I've mentioned a minute ago, but just in case you're joining us, my name is Charlotte Marshall. I'm the director of Seville Kairos UK and joined tonight from our partner Kairos Palestine um, and represented by Rifat Karsis, who is the general secretary. And um, this webinar is being recorded, so you've been asked to accept that. If you don't want to be on video, uh, please just turn your video off. If you want to rename yourself or make yourself anonymous, you can do. Uh, the recording will go on our YouTube channel at a later date. So I'm really delighted to welcome everybody. I'm really delighted to have Rifat with us. Um, he's had his fair share of internet problems the last couple of nights. So fingers crossed we're all okay for today. Uh, very briefly going to introduce Rifat. As I said, he is the general coordinator of uh, Kairos Palestine. He has been a non-violent activist um, in Palestine against the occupation for decades, uh, was the original founder of Defence for Children International Palestine and worked for them in a number of roles as well as being uh, their global director and coordinator at times. Um, Rifat, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, it's, we're so much looking forward to hearing from you. I know you're joining us from Bethlehem tonight, which is at the heart of um, uh, where a lot of people here have been and visited. So we bring you our greetings from the UK and we're going to hand over to you now. Uh, you've got 30 minutes and then after that, we'll have time for questions and answers. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Am I heard well? Yes. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Sabil Kairos, for inviting me to address you this evening. Dear sisters and brothers, Mr. Netanyahu briefly summarized his intentions about the West Bank on September 2nd, when he once again presented his expanded map depicting the full annexation of the West Bank, Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. This map effectively claims all of historic Palestine as part of the State of Israel, period. This wasn't the first time he has shown this map. He has done so on several occasions, including during his speech, if you remember, at the United Nations General Assembly a few months ago. This aligns perfectly with the ongoing incursions, aggression, and attacks against Palestinians in the West Bank, as well as the ethnic cleansing intentions recently expressed by his foreign minister, Israel Katz, if you also heard him. To be honest, neither this map nor the speeches by Netanyahu and his foreign minister surprised us at all. This has always been the policy of this government and all previous Israeli governments. Because sometimes people try to differentiate, oh, this is a right-wing government, as if the previous governments were any better. Regardless of who is in power, Israel's policy and practice in the West Bank remain unchanged. Killing, maiming, land theft, settlement buildings, settler violence, movement restrictions, ethnic cleansing, forced displacement, and the systematic effort to make Palestinian life so unbearable that they live on their own, just to name a few. We have always known that while the criminal and horrific war is being waged on Gaza and its people, the true focus and interest of Israel lie in the West Bank and Jerusalem, which they refer to as Judea and Samaria. These areas are seen as integral parts of Israel. Many Israeli leaders have long viewed Gaza as a demographic threat. When they withdrew from it in 2005 and imposed a complete siege and blockade in 2006, their intent was clear to let Gaza sink into the sea. Rabin said it, Sharon said it, many Israeli leaders, they said the same, let Gaza sink in the sea. 
In doing so, they effectively isolated 2.2 million people living in a 350 square kilometer area. It is one of the worst places to live with all these overcrowded people living in, in such a small area. Gaza blockade, according to the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Gaza, said that this blockade has created dire humanitarian conditions and led to the internal displacement of thousands of Palestinians. The UN has repeatedly called for the lifting of the blockade, citing its devastating impact on the civilian people. The World Health Organization and UNICEF have documented how the blockade and repeated military offensives have displaced large numbers of Palestinians in Gaza, often leaving them without adequate shelter, health care, and access to basic necessities. All this was before the 7th of October 2023, because many people, including the British media, like to start the history on the 7th of October as if there was nothing before. Nothing was before. Everything started on the 7th of October. But to come back to the West Bank, as it is the topic of our meeting tonight, Israel's plans to annex the West Bank or parts of it have been discussed and implemented in various forms over the years, especially since the 1967 war. When Israel occupied the West Bank, including Jerusalem and Gaza, Soon after Israeli governments began establishing settlements in the West Bank, signaling long-term intentions to integrate parts of the territory into Israel, immediately after the 1967 war. In 1977, when the Likud party, led by Menachem Begin at that time, came to power, there was also an explicit shift toward supporting the annexation of parts of the West Bank and promoted settlement expansion. But don't misunderstand me. The settlement did not start at the Likud's time. It started at the labor's time. Many, many Europeans like to call the Labour Party as the leftist or the left of Israel. They started the settlement movement. This is very important to know and to realize. In 1980, Israel formally annexed East Jerusalem. Although this annexation, I mean, has not been internationally recognized. But this move set a precedent for the potential annexation of the other parts of the West Bank. Of course, during the Oslo Accords in the 90s, and as you probably know, the West Bank was divided into area E, A, B, and C, with Israel maintaining full control over Area C, which constitutes about 60%, if not 62% of the West Bank. While these accords were supposed to lead to a final peace agreement, the division also allowed Israel to maintain de facto control over significant portions of the West Bank. Today, Israel and its army directly control and rule the entire West Bank without any respect to the agreements they had signed with the Palestinian Authority. We should not also forget the construction of the segregation wall in the early 2000 something, which cuts deep into the West Bank and was seen by many as a form of de facto annexation of more land. Throughout the 2010s, Israeli politicians increasingly called for the formal annexation of parts of the West Bank, particularly Area C. It became public. I mean, actually, they were competing at that time who will lead this annexation processes. Of course, Area C was all the time the subject and the target because most Israeli settlements are located in Area C. In 2019, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu explicitly promised to annex parts of the West Bank, particularly the Jordan Valley, during his election campaign. And 
needless to say that Mr. Netanyahu has repeatedly said there will be no Palestinian state. And today even he said a Palestinian state is a threat to global peace. To have a Palestinian state, state this is a threat to the existence of the state of Israel because it will be a terrorist state. I mean, this this kind of 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 speeches i mean showed the intentions of the israeli uh, policy the annexation plans and and this is i think we should also understand and 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 note gained significant momentum with the trump administration's peace to prosperity plan i think it was in 2020 allowing israel to annex about 30% of the West Bank, include, including the Jordan Valley and all Israeli settlements. This was the deal at that time. Netanyahu at that time, Netanyahu's government set July 1st, 2020 as the initial date to begin the annexation process, if you remember. However, due to international pressure and domestic considerations, the plan was officially suspended, but never canceled. Instead, it has been quietly implemented through de facto annexation via settlement expansion, legal measures, and infrastructure destructions in the West Bank. Today, we are witnessing an unprecedented escalation of deadly violence, particularly in the northern cities of the West Bank. Jenin, Tulkarem, Tobas, Nablus, and the surrounding villages. If you follow this week's news, you will see the toll this violence has taken. Many Palestinians, including children, have been killed, maimed, or forced from their homes. Demolished infrastructure. I mean, streets were destroyed, swept out of life, water networks shattered, and residents forcibly displaced from their neighborhoods and refugee camps. Honestly, I don't know if the British media had shown what happened to Jenin or to Tulkarim in the past week. I mean, some journalists, they spoke about Jenin and Tulkarim, that it took Gaza 10 months to be destroyed like what happened in Jenin and Tulkarim in 48 hours. It's amazing how, how brilliant they were in, in, in destroying the lives of, of people in Jenin and in, in Tulkarim. In other areas such as Bethlehem, Israeli authorities have recently issued a military order to establish a new settlement called Nahal Helitz. It's near the city. This decision is deeply troubling development for Bethlehem, particularly for the villages surrounding it and the area known as Al Makhrur. Charlotte, maybe you were in, in Al Makhrur. I mean, every, every supporter and friend comes to Bethlehem. Usually we take him to Al Makhrur. So not anymore, because Al Makhrur is not anymore available for us. It is largely owned by Christian families from Bejala, and, and some have also restaurants uh, there. It is the last green area in, in, in Bethlehem governorates. Of course, the settlement will not just disrupt the territorial continuity of the region, but also will pose a grave threat to the land, heritage, and lives of the people of Bethlehem. Just to tell you that Al Makhrur and Betir, the village next to it, they are registered as, as her heritage, protected heritage by, by UNESCO. And it will, it will also create a settlement block from Gosh Atzion to Jerusalem, isolating Bethlehem from its Western villages. You know, it's good to remind you that Bethlehem today, I think we have 195,000 Palestinians and we have around 160,000 settlers. In Bethlehem, 
I think the Palestinians, I used to think that we own around 11% from the land, but the mayor of Bethlehem, uh, in one of his uh, meetings with one of our delegation, he said, Bethlehem only, owned only 6.8% from the land. But now with the current confiscation, which I'm going to speak about, I think the percentage will drop down maybe to 2 or 3% only. And if you know that Bethlehem area is the, is the main uh, residence for Christians, you will understand how devastating this will be on the Christian presence uh, soon. But also, I mean, here we are talking about the western side of Bethlehem, but in the east, at the border of my town, Beit Sahur, Charlotte, you were in Beit Sahur, you know it. The Israeli authorities installed an iron gate there three days ago. So there is now an iron gate, and this gate will control the entrance and exit, not only for the people of Bethlehem, but also for those in Hebron, as it is the main roads connecting the southern and northern parts of the West Bank. This gate will further isolate Beit Sahur and Bethlehem from their eastern villages. So the, the settlements will isolate uh, Bethlehem from the western villages, and this iron gate will isolate Beit Sahur from the uh, eastern uh, villages. Today in Bethlehem area, more than 20 different locations are subjected to daily harassment and violence by settlers and the army. More than 20 points, 20 places. These actions include land confiscation orders, arrest campaigns, settler attacks, on the attacks on communities east of Beit Sahur, there is a village called Kisan. It's a small community, actually. The settlers have been stealing their herds, poisoning their water wells, and even beating parents and their children, just to chase them out. In some other villages, homes are demolished under the pretext that building in Area C is prohibited. Villages are attacked with homes and cars being shot at. In the village of Wad Rahal, which is not far from here, last week, settlers killed one person, and severely injured four others, all while the army provided the settlers with protection. Unfortunately, and I know for sure that none of these events will reach the official global Western media. Unfortunately. For decades, the Israeli occupation has deepened through different mechanisms that systematically erode the presence and rights of the Palestinian people. This occupation has not only entrenched a system of apartheid, but also given rise to what some observers describe as a silent genocide, the title of our meeting tonight. A slow and deliberate process of disposition, impoverishment, and eraser of Palestinian life and culture. Silent genocide, maybe it's not any more silent. Now it's becoming to, to become loud, clearer, and, and very visible. At the core of this silent genocide is the relentless expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. These settlements, illegal under international law, as you know, now house around 1 million Israeli settlers and continue to grow. Even though, I mean, we, we, should, also, we should also know that uh, uh, with uh, Ben Gifir as the minister of, of uh, national security or whatever they, they want to call him, he armed settlers. So out of this 1 million settlers, at least 400,000 are well-armed, well-equipped, well-trained. And these people, I mean, you just need to watch a Western film for John Wayne or Clint Eastwood and, and see how the 
the white cowboys chasing out the red Indians. Unfortunately, we are the red Indians. And these settlers, I mean, their only, their only aim is really to force removal of Palestinians from their homes, farms, and land. According to the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, we call it OCHA, according to their documentation, the demolition of Palestinian homes in the West Bank, including Jerusalem, often under the pretext of lacking Israeli-issued building permits, but also as a collective punishment, lead to the forced displacement of Palestinian families. And they, they, they say that between 2009 and 2020, over than 7,000 Palestinians were displaced due to this. And of course, the years after, there is an alarming increase of all these forced dis displacement. And these are OCHA, I mean, OCHA documentation. The village of Khan al-Ahmar on the road to Jericho, maybe some of you who visited our area for sure visited this Khan al-Ahmar. Khan al-Ahmar, this is the place where the Good Samaritan story happened. For example, this city, this, uh, I mean, it's a village, a, com a community, a Bedouin community actually, has become like a symbol of the struggle. Despite international outcry, despite of Palestinian outcry, the Israeli government has repeatedly attempted to demolish this Bedouin village to make way for settlement expansion, threatening to displace its residents to areas with little access to basic services. And you know, many of the Bedouin communities in Palestine, they were also forced, displaced, forced to be settled in places where there are lack of service and changing their heritage, changing their way of, of life. And I, I'm sure the ones who visit Palestine, definitely they met some of these Bedouin uh, communities. Hebron also is another story. It is a city where tensions are, are particularly high, the old city has been gradually emptied of its Palestinian residents. Once a dynamic commercial center, Hebron's old city now resembles a ghost town with Palestinian shops closed, streets besieged, and residents living under constant surveillance and harassment by both settlers and, and soldiers. Uh, Shari al-Shuhada, definitely, I mean, if you are in Hebron, you should have visited this, this empty street, actually. Uh, they have to put uh, iron nets in order to protect themselves from the garbage and from whatever the settlers living in the second floors, I mean, throw uh, on them. This, the presence of around 80, 850 settlers, maybe less, in the heart of Hebron, guarded by thousands of Israeli soldiers, has made life intolerable for the remaining Palestinian population in, in Hebron. This forced displacement, although less visible than mass expulsion, serves the same purpose, to clear Palestinians from their land to make way for Jewish settlers. The situation is further exacerbated by the severe restrictions placed on, on Palestinian access to essential resources, such as water, land, and healthcare. Israel controls most of the water resources in the West Bank, allocating disproportionate amounts to settlements while limiting access for Palestinian communities. You know, I am living in an area where Every month, we have water for 24 hours. Once a month. And we were th thinking that we are, I mean, I mean, it's so bad for us, but I discovered that in some other areas, in Bejala, for instance, every two months, they receive 24 hours water. And this push us to, 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 to rely on purchasing expensive water tankers, while settlers, I mean, I am living not far from a settlement here, it's maybe less than one kilometer, 
they enjoy unrestricted access to water. Many of them, they have their swimming pools. Even. This disparity not only undermines Palestinian ability to maintain their agricultural life, livelihood, but also poses a direct threat to their survival. Without water, there is no survival. Land confiscation is another tool of the silent genocide. The Israeli government, governments, not government, because this was the policy and practice all the time, regularly declares large spaces of Palestinian land as state land, which is then used for settlement construction or military purposes. The village of Nabi Samuel, for instance, has been cut off from the rest of the West Bank by the annexation wall, with residents denied access to their farmland, jobs, and health care. The village is slowly being strangled, its population declining as people leave in search of better conditions elsewhere. No one is able even to criticize them. How can they live with such, with such, I mean, a sieged, besieged area? The UN Security Resolution, the, the UN Security Council Resolution, I mean, we make jokes about it, but has repeatedly condemned the expansion of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories, as they are illegal under international law, contribute to the displacement of Palestinians by appropriating land and resources that Palestinians depend, de depend on, on for their livelihoods. I mean, many, many resolutions, many statements, but with zero respect from Israel and its Western allies. Even the ones who, I mean, make such resolutions at the United Nations, they do not honor it. Then we come to the dual legal system. The legal framework governing the West Bank operates on a dual system. Charlotte, do, we st do I still have time? Yeah, yeah? Okay. So the legal framework in the West Bank operates on a dual system. Israeli settlers are subject to Israeli civil law and Palestinians live under Israeli military law. So in an area where there is a settlement and a Palestinian village, if, if, a, if a Jewish child throw a stone, uh, I don't know on what, he will be persecuted, trialed in a, in a, in a civil uh, court. Uh, his people, will, his parents will attend, the interrogation will be recorded, etc., with videos. But a Palestinian child, he will be trialed in a military court with a military judge. This is another story. Maybe <clears throat> in a different time, we can speak about how racist the system is. Even the criminal age responsibility of children is different. The majority of children age is different. This dual system enforces a regime of racial discrimination that includes every aspect of life. For instance, Palestinians can be detained indefinitely without trial under administrative detention orders. And by the way, the detention, I mean, administrative detention order, uh, you British have to be, I mean, uh, uh, proud of yourself because this was, <laughs> this law was, I mean, created by, by Britain in 1945. This practice widely condemned as a violation of human rights, but no one respects this. In contrast, settlers who commit crimes against Palestinians, such as arson, physical attacks, killing, and maiming, are often treated leniently by Israeli courts if they are persecuted at all. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories has been issuing reports explaining that Israel's planning and zoning pol policies in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are discriminatory. And this is how they have the ability to, to demolish homes. Uh, under this, 
planning and, and zoning uh, uh, policies. These policies severely restrict Palestinian construction while facilitating the expansion of Israeli settlements. This planning regime has been described as part of a larger strategy to maintain a Jewish majority in these areas by displacing Palestinians. Silent genocide. Furthermore, the UNRWA, for instance, has documented the revocation of residency rights of Palestinians residing in East Jerusalem, a practice that has forced many Palestinians to leave the city. Since 1967, Israel has revoked the residency status of over 15,000 Palestinians, 15,000 Palestinians. And if you multiply it with five or six members of the family, you got the, the number, the exact number of, of Palestinians who were chased out of Jerusalem because they failed to prove that their center life is in Jerusalem. Meaning that to maintain your residency rights in Jerusalem, you have to live and work in Jerusalem. If you work in Jerusalem and you reside, you live in Bethlehem, this is not kosher. Then you are subject, your ID is subject to be revoked and vice versa. If a Jerusalemite will marry a West Banker, she cannot live in Jerusalem because she's not kosher enough. She's a West Banker. If he lives in the West Bank with his wife, then his ID will be revoked. So now there are two areas around Jerusalem. One we call it Bir'ona, it is in, 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 in Beit Jala. And another one, Kafr Aqab, it is between Ramallah and Jerusalem, where all these cases live there. Live in, a, in, in an area which is not planned, not structured, people building over each other's, overcrowded, and all of them, they live in an uncertainty because their homes might be demolished, I mean, overnight. But Israel, they allow it because they don't want these people to be pushed back to Jerusalem. So I live outside in some sort of refugee camps because it's like refugee camps. So your center life has to be in Jerusalem, work, and life. So you, if you are from London, you are, I mean, you cannot work in Birmingham because then you will lose your residency permit in London. Such, such a law. Of course, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has criticized these practices. They consider it as, as violation of the right to freedom of movement and residence. And as part of a broader policy of demographic engineering. You know, I have a niece, her daughter. She is now 26 years old. She completed her law studies and she became a licensed lawyer. She doesn't have a birth certificate. She doesn't have an ID because her father is a Jerusalemite and her niece is a West Banker from Beit Sahur. And this girl, she was born in Beit Sahur, and till today, they are unable to get her an ID. She's, I don't know how to call it, stateless, 26 years old. She's unable to move in the West Bank without an ID. It's very dangerous. She cannot leave the country because she doesn't have any official paper. And she's one out of 10,000 cases similar to her case. 10,000. During my work in DCI, Defense for Children International, we registered around 8,000 child, uh, at that time, under 18 years of old, who do not pose any kind of, of, uh, of documents. The legal apartheid is compounded by state-sanctioned and state-encouraged and tolerated such kind of laws and violence. Settler violence against Palestinians has increased sharply in recent years. I mean, I gave different examples. 
acts of violence range from the uprooting of olive trees, destruction grooves, which is a vital source of income for many Palestinian families, to burning cars and homes, to physical assaults, and even murder. The killing of Palestinian teenager Ali Abu Ali, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, long ago, by Israeli soldiers during a protest against land confiscation is just one tragic example of the lethal consequences of this environment of impunity. And here I will end by talking a bit about the international complicity and the failure of accountability. The situation in the West Bank is not only a product of Israeli policies, but also of international complicity. Even the genocide of war on Gaza. I mean, this is a joint, joint action, United States, Germany, France, UK. Okay, I mean, uh, your new government uh, restricted 30, I don't know how you call it, uh, permits out of 350. Yeah. So, I mean, this means uh, kill them, but I mean, uh, on, on a softer base. I mean, don't kill them. Uh, I mean, uh, kill them all. I mean, a little bit. So this lack of meaningful action by the international community, despite the UN General Assembly and Human Rights Council, numerous resolutions, which have called on Israel to seize its displacement policies, to comply with international law, including the Fourth Geneva Convention and all human rights treaties. These resolutions, however, remain unimplemented leading to ongoing displacement and ethnic cleansing and has allowed these practices to continue unabated. The International Court of Justice, just, I mean, previously, the advisory opinion. No, let, let us start with the, with the 2004 advisory opinion on the legality of the, of the separation wall or the segregation wall. This underscores that Israel's policies, including the construction of the wall, have led to the displacement of Palestinians and the fragmentation of their communities. The court found that the wall's route, largely within the West Bank, violated international law and contributed to de facto annexation of Palestinian land. The European Union, the United States, and other global powers have largely limited their responses to statements of concern. We are concerned without taking the necessary steps to hold Israel accountable for its violations of international law. You know, the recent rulings of the ICJ and also the ICC were not respected or honored by Israel. And this is, I mean, to, to, this is not a surprise. But to be not respected and honored by many European countries, this is a scandal. The ICJ and the ICC is, is not our invention. It is the invention of, of, of the, the system, the civilized Western system. So they created the system, but they do not respect it. And it is completely true that the ICJ and the ICC were designed to protect the strong, not the poor. So Putin can be trial there. Russia can be trial there. Iran, Syria, China, but not Egypt, not, uh, not Israel, not Germany. Such a double standard, which sometimes goes, I mean, beyond imagination, how this cruel world works. And this failure of accountability definitely has emboldened the Israeli state to pursue its policies of annexation and displacement and genocide with little fear of repercussions. Say whatever you want and I will continue doing what I am supposed to do. The cumulative effect of these policies and practices is a slow motion process of erasure one that does not fit the conventional image of genocide, but which nonetheless systematically seeks to eliminate the Palestinian presence in the West Bank. As settlements expand, resources dwindle, dwindle violence escalates, 
Palestinians are left with increasingly few options. Many are forced to leave their homes and communities, not but overt, not by overt expulsions, but by the unbearable conditions created by the occupation. What they did in Jenin, the destruction of the infrastructure there, I mean, there is a, a very pre preliminary statistics that 500 families, they have to, to move from their neighborhood to find another places. And where to find other places? Who's going to pay their rent? This silent genocide is a deliberate strategy to make life so difficult for Palestinians that they have no choice but to leave, thereby fulfilling the goal of creating a greater Israel free of its indigenous people. As this strategy continues to unfold, the world must confront the reality that without urgent and sustained intervention, the Palestinian people may be pushed to the brink of extinction in their own homeland. And I will stop here and thank you. Thank you, Rifat. Um, oh gosh, so much food for thought. Um, what I want to do is just to let everybody know that we're going to stop the recording here. So if you are listening again, thank you for joining us and uh, we will post our next webinar soon and that will be available online as well. So goodbye to anybody um, that's joined us um, uh, on Catch Up.